I will be um, talking about overcoming the blood tumor barrier and the management of CNS metastases. Um, so one of the hurdles in the treatment of, the, of CNS metastases is the blood brain barrier um, or the blood tumor barrier. And so for a cancer therapy to be effective, it has to cross the blood vessel wall to reach the cancer cell in adequate quantities. And then it has to overcome the resistance conferred by the local microenvironment around these cells. Um, and so for my presentation today, I'll briefly discuss what is known about this complex barrier. Um, and I'll highlight some emerging molecular, cellular, and physical strategies to improve drug delivery across the blood-brain barrier and blood tumor barriers. Um, and then I'll present a protocol that's in development and hopefully will be opening in the next couple of months um, using one of these strategies um, for patients with brain metastases related to um, non-small cell lung cancer. So I have um, nothing to disclose. Um, and I'd like to start by showing this slide that essentially demonstrates the complexity of the blood-brain barrier and changes that occur um, in the setting of the formation of the blood tumor barrier and setting of brain metastases. Um, and so the blood-brain barrier consists of a continuous layer of specialized cells or endothelial, endothelial cells um, linked together. Um, uh, by tight junctions. And this layer is supported uh, by adhesions and interactions with basement mem membranes, ba uh, brain pericytes, astrocytes, and neurons, or the neurovascular unit, and is regulated through a number of different signaling pathways. Um, and it essentially separates the central nervous system from the rest of the body and has really evolved to tightly regulate the exchange of most substances um, through paracellular and transcellular routes. And it's essentially a protective mechanism for the central nervous system. So in the in brain metastases, there here there's co-option of blood vessels, there's hijacking of the neurovascular unit, and essentially this increases permeability of the blood tumor barrier. Um, but the permeability can vary; it's pretty heterogeneous. It can vary from the tumor core to the periphery of the tumor. Um, it can vary between different primaries. It can also vary between different subtypes of the same um, same cancer. And even when uh, circumstances, uh, even when there is increased permeability of the blood tumor barrier, um, it, it's the penetration is still limited. And that's often because of size of uh, the large size of drugs that we use to treat systemic cancers, ionization, hydrophilicity, and or protein binding of these agents. So it's it, even in, in those circumstances, it's not ideal. And for, for even small lipophilic molecules that can get through um, and cross the blood brain barrier and the blood tumor barrier, there are transmembrane efflux pumps that then um, will, uh, will get it back out essentially. And so in an attempt to over, in an attempt to overcome uh, some of these, these issues with, with drug penetration, um, the multiple strategies are being refined, and these essentially can be grouped into those that are minimally invasive and those that are more invasive. Um, minimally invasive approaches include those that alter drugs um, uh, to increase permeability. So, for example, ANG1005 is an LRP1 paclitaxel peptide that increased drug penetration greater than 50 fold into brain metastases when compared to paclitaxel alone. And this essentially re relies on the LRP1 transport system. Um, there are also physical approaches such as focused ultrasound with microbubbles and radiation um, given, given concurrently with systemic therapies that are being explored. And more invasive approaches essentially um, bypass the blood-brain barrier through direct administration of a drug into a metastasis or into a tumor. Um, and these strategies include convection-enhanced delivery or direct injection of drugs, implantation of wafers, and commonly used to treat in, uh, leptomeningeal metastasis is intrathecal or intraventricular um, injection of drug. And the vast majority of studies to date have been in primary brain tumors, um, but there are increasing efforts to try and use these in, in brain metastases. So I will shift our focus for the remainder of the talk on one particular strategy, focused ultrasound um, with microbubbles. So the use of focused ultrasound has really come into favor in recent years, largely because of advances in technology and as an alternative to surgery because it's less invasive. Um, to date, there's a single approved a, a, a device, um, an MR guided focused ultrasound device. It's the Exablate, um, uh, InsightTech Exablate um, focused ultrasound. 
Um, and it's approved for the treatment of essential tremor uh, and tremor dominant Parkinson's disease. And essentially it uses a helmet linked to an MRI that has a phased array of transducers which can um, hone into a single, a single point. Um, the biological effect of focused ultrasound can essentially um, is essentially de dependent um, in, or divided into thermal um, and and uh, mechanical effects, and and this is essentially controlled by the speed of oscillation of the ultrasound. So the acoustic pressure causes these bubbles to expand and contract, either generating heat or placing mechanical stress on the endothelial, endothelial cells and transiently opening the blood-brain barrier. Um, in humans, um, focus ultrasound has been um, shown to be effective for thermoablation, transient opening of the blood-brain barrier, as well as neuromodulation when given to larger areas of brain. And there are ongoing studies looking at its use in hypother hyperthermia um, to increase radio sensitivity or radio, sensitiz radio sensitization and also for immunomodulation. Um, uh, for transducing, um, for, sorry, for um, nanoparticle drug delivery, as well as um, histotripsy. And specifically for the blood-brain barrier, for opening of the blood-brain barrier for drug delivery, um, the safety and efficacy of focus ultrasound has been demonstrated in hundreds of, of uh, preclinical studies. Early phase studies are ongoing with some promising emerging data and um, a first in human trial in a small number of patients with HER2 positive breast cancer and brain metastases showed enhanced delivery of trastuzumab uh, using this technique. So I'll, I'll um, go over some of those results. So this was a first in human trial that was conducted in Canada. It's very small. It was in four patients with HER2 positive breast cancer with progressive brain metastases. All patients had anywhere between one to three brain metastases. They had prior treatment with radiation, had stable systemic disease. Um, and the treatment was a combination of MR-guided focused ultrasound together with trastuzumab and pert pertuzumab. Um, in the course of the study, 20 procedures were performed. Um, no serious adverse events were reported. Um, and to assess the effect of focused ultrasound on the penetration of trastuzumab, a 111 indium radio label trastuzumab was used, which then could be visualized on SPECT. And so they were able to demonstrate a number of different things. So these are images for a single patient with a solitary cerebellar brain metastasis. And the color map of acoustic emission showed immediate increased permeability within the treated tumor. So you see increased um, enhancement that then normalized one day after treatment. So this was a, tr a transient opening of the blood-brain barrier. And SPECT imaging with radio labeled trastuzumab in the same patient showed increased penetration within four hours of the procedure. And there was delayed retention as well. Um, and this was seen in, in all treated lesions. Um, in addition, all um, target tumors were reduced in size. So these are MRIs of all four patients. Um, and uh, they saw a reduction in size on an average of about 19% in follow-up. And follow-up ranged anywhere between three to 13 months. So there was a large span there. Um, and while this is a small study um, with its limitations, it did provide some proof of concept um, and compelling first-in-human data. Um, for the potential role of MR-guided focus ultrasound um, to treat limited CNS disease. And so there's growing interest on how to best use this technology and with what combinations and with which systemic agents. So there is a currently a, a randomized study that um, is hopefully opening. It's in development and, and um, opening um, in the next couple of months, uh, hopefully at UCSF. Um, assessing the role of MR-guided focused ultrasound in um, uh, patients with brain metastases and non-small cell lung cancer. Um, and we know that approximately 20% of patients with non-small cell lung cancer are found to have brain metastases at time of their initial diagnosis. And for those patients that are pdl one positive without an EGFR or ALK mutation, checkpoint blockade has been um, shown to be superior as compared to conventional chemotherapy alone for a subset of patients. Um, and while CNS responses have been reported, um, immunotherapies such as pembrolizumab are large antibodies that have limited CNS penetration. And so the study is essentially trying to assess the use of focused ultrasound in improving penetration of the drug and efficacy in patients with brain metastases. 
Um, and so again, this is uh, this study is specific for adult patients with an initial di initial diagnosis of non-small cell lung cancer with brain metastases um, that are planned to receive standard of care first line um, pembrolizumab. How do I go back? <laughs> There we go. Okay. So the study is divided in two stages. There's a, a, a safety lead in where five patients will be enrolled, all of whom will receive up to six procedures, each with uh, standard of care pembrolizumab, after which they'll continue um, uh, pembrolizumab um, uh, ongoing. And um, depending on the safety data, depending on the results of that first uh, uh, portion of the study, it will then lead into the randomized portion where, where patients are randomized two to one to receive pembrolizumab with focused ultrasound or pembrolizumab alone. It's an unblinded study. The uh, patients require measurable CNS disease and all uh, patients that are, uh, that are randomized to the, um, to the combination will uh, undergo up to six exablate procedures to up to three previously untreated brain metastases concurrent with pembrolizumab and then continue with pembro. Um, and the study does allow for control arm subjects uh, to be offered crossover to treatment. So this is the study scheme. Um, and I will highlight again, because the scheme is a little bit confusing, that this is for patients with concurrent brain metastases at the time of initial diagnosis that are planned uh, for treatment with pembrolizumab monotherapy. Um, and after screening, essentially patients will either receive the combination or pembrolizumab alone, and the procedures are done every three weeks together with the infusions, um, about uh, two hours prior to the infusion, um, up for a total of up to six procedures, after which again pembrolizumab um, will be continued. Um, again, this protocol, in this protocol, patients forego radiation um, and um, it, for the control arm, uh, patients are allowed again to cross over um, at the time of progression. In terms of the endpoints, the primary endpoints are um, their safety and efficacy uh, determined by responder analysis. And then the secondary endpoints essentially include a number of additional um, efficacy measures. And there are some exploratory endpoints um, that include quality of life measures and a measurement of blood brain barrier disruption um, using post sonication MRIs. In terms of long term follow up, all patients will be followed through the end of life um, looking at these particular measures. So of course, this particular study does have some potential limitations in enrollment and does reflect some of the challenges that we face in, in designing trials for CNS metastatic disease, um, but it, it will provide much needed data on the use of focused ultrasound um, and open potential avenues for future use of, of this technology. And one simple approach really is using focused ultrasound with combination therapies as opposed to a single immunotherapy or a single drug. Um, another uh, uh, potential avenue is looking at the immunologic impact of focused ultrasound. Um, and we know that there are some there are preclinical studies that have shown focused ultrasound can affect um, the it, it essentially can immunomodulate the tumor microenvironment around a metastasis. So this might prove fr fruitful in terms of optimizing treatment in other prime in other primaries such as renal cell carcinoma or melanoma. And it may also offer a non-invasive approach for treatment of tumors that in, are in non-surgical areas, such as the brainstem or spinal cord. Um, and an emerging use of focused ultrasound is hypo, hyperthermia um, in terms of uh, increasing um, tumor cell chemotherapy and uh, increasing immunogenicity of the tumors and radiosensitivity. Um, and in the future, there may be a role in using this technology for nanoparticle drug delivery or oncolytic viral therapies. So with that, I'd like to thank um, everyone here who's been supportive of this endeavor and has, has helped support this work. And I'd just like to, to thank everyone for their attention. Just one uh, area of, uh, of, of blood-brain barrier, and then it's going to go into that tumor, or is the idea that you're just generally disrupting? It's uh, a good question. Yeah. So the limitation, so the focus ultrasound really just works on the area of treatment. It doesn't impact blood-brain bar barrier penetration distant from that area. 
from where you're you're giving the focus ultrasound. So in some ways there is limitations in that it doesn't increase penetration of drugs throughout the entire central nervous system, but is used more for local control, similar to, to gamma knife. So in that case, what, I mean, I, and, and maybe this is just too overly simplistic, but what, what's wrong with just putting in some drug directly into the, the CSF or, or even into the extra, uh, you know, in that, in that space between the arachnoid and, you know, or something like that. Why, why not? I mean, a lot of these checkpoints are super safe and, you know, we've used them IT, but, but other people have used them in different places too. Why not just put them right into the brain so that you could I think the limits, so the limitations of giving drugs intrathecally is that when you're dealing with parenchymal, parenchymal brain metastases, those drugs tend not to penetrate deep enough um, into the parenchyma to be able to be effective. Um, and so having technology that can increase penetration within the parenchyma itself um, will treat those metastases better. Intrathecal approaches and intraventricular approaches tend to be more effective when we're dealing with leptomeningeal disease as opposed to more bulky kind of parenchymal or even smaller parenchymal metastases. And, and you, what about the extracellular fluid or the extracellular space? It's, I, I mean, I, there's all this uh, thing about the lymph, lymph circulation and stuff like that. Can, is there not a way to just put like vapors put and things like that? In? Not that I know of. To isolate and, and give it just to that area? No. Yeah. Good question. Thank you, though.